My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Monday, October 21st, 2013, and I'm interviewing Lisa Rutherford as part of the Oklahoma Native Artist Project sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at OSU. We're at the Cherokee Arts Center where Lisa has a studio and displays her work. Lisa, you also paint and do Southeastern applique beadwork and have won several yes. first place and best of division awards. From pottery to feather capes, which I see a lot of artists picking up on. You're deeply involved with the Cherokee artists and community projects, including the National uh, Treasures Association, of which you're a board member. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born right here in Cherokee County in Tahlequah and I grew up on, well I grew up on a dairy out west of town which now it's a cattle ranch and I still live out on the family ranch. That's wonderful. What, and so your folks uh, talk a little bit about daily living over there. Well I grew up taking care of cattle, <laughs> working, I learned to work hard on the dairy. Uh, my sister and I both uh, had to work. We had our chores. We had animals to take care of, and we had horses. And um, we helped help my dad with the dairy all we could. Were um, either of your grandparents close by? Um, either set. My dad's parents lived uh, just up the road until I think I was five and six when we lost uh, first my grandmother and then my grandfather. But my mom's dad, Joe Thornton, is 97, 98 years old, and he still lives out at Park Hill. What was your relationship with them, either side? Um, my dad's parents, they, they were, uh, we saw them every day. We had a pretty close relationship, but I was pretty young when I lost them, and um, I, I still have some good memories. Did you um, get a lot of exposure to the language growing up? Not a lot. Um, my great granny on my mom's side, she taught, she tried to teach us. But her kids, she grew up, her, her children grew up in the boarding school era. So she didn't teach them the language. She said she didn't want them speaking broken English. And of course at that time there was the pressure from the schools to not speak Cherokee. So she didn't teach them, and then later I think she regretted it and tried to teach the grandkids and great-grandkids. Did you have any extended family members who were artistic? My grandmother on my mom's side painted, and she's probably the one that got me started. Uh, she probably stirred my interest in art. She would let me play with her oil paints her uh, pastels, and she taught me how to draw when I was probably, I remember being about five, I think. I have to go by which house she lived in at the time, but she's the one that taught me how to draw. What kinds of things did you draw? Oh, I think we drew like a lot of flowers, plants. Um, I can remember trying to draw people animals. Uh, when I was young, I, I drew horses constantly because I always liked horses, always had horses, and so I was always drawing horses. So what are your earliest memories of seeing Native art? Hmm. I can't really remember the earliest um, I saw my grandmother's paintings, but they weren't really native art. She did mostly landscapes and um, maybe architecture, you know, buildings. Uh, she did Golda's Old Mill. She painted that. And I don't know. I never really thought about my first exposure. I don't think I distinguished it from other art. It was just art. Would um, sort of drawing and painting be among your earliest memories of making art? Do you have any memories before that? Yeah, probably the drawing and the painting. But I didn't paint until, I think my grandmother quit painting 
uh, at some point I continued drawing but I didn't have paint anymore so from the time um, someone gave me some paints when I was like in the fifth grade and I painted a picture but I didn't paint again until 2009 so I'm just just really learning to paint properly <laughs> Well, what were your art experiences like in elementary school? None. We didn't have art. We would get to color, um, maybe... I do remember uh, getting to play with finger paints one year, but we had no art classes. And, and when I was a junior, they finally had an art class at my high school. Did you learn anything there that you sort of carried with you? I learned a lot about drawing. Um, I got to take art when I was a junior and senior, and um, that was my first classes in art, my first drawing lessons, and uh, we did a little bit of pottery, we did a little bit of jewelry. He just tried to give us the basics of everything, and my art teacher was the only person that encouraged me to go to college. Yeah, nobody at my high school had ever encouraged us to go. But he's probably the reason that I enrolled. And where where did you enroll? I enrolled at NSU three weeks after I graduated from high school. And I was an art major, but um, my parents weren't very happy about that. They wanted me to do something that, that I could make a living at. And I had an art teacher that also discouraged me because I didn't want to be a teacher. And he, it was a ceramics teacher, and he told me that I wasn't good enough. Amazing. <laughs> so did you hang in there, or did you switch your major? I changed my major to office administration. And I worked most of my uh, career um, doing clerical or administrative type work. After graduating? Mm -hmm. Were you working at The Nation or? Um, I worked at Northeastern for a little while and then I worked for The Nation. Um, I spent the last, let's see, I was, I was Chief Smith's executive assistant for 10 years and I got a lot of good experience there, a lot of opportunities that maybe I wouldn't have had elsewhere. And I learned a lot about uh, Cherokee history um, the current issues, legal aspects of, you know, the issues that were going on with the nation. And then after that, I spent three years working for Cherokee Nation Entertainment. And that, that was not a good choice. <laughs> but at some point you got interested in art again. Can you tell us that story? 2004, I was burned out. I was stressed from work. And working for the chief is a very high stress job and I was just I just felt like there was something missing in my life and I realized um, a friend of mine took me up to Bill Glass's studio up at Locust Grove and they were working on the ceramic art installation for the passage in Chattanooga Tennessee and uh, my friend Ken introduced me to Bill and Bill just shook my hand and handed me a piece of fired clay and a brush and some iron oxide. I said, here, put five coats on here. Let it dry, <laughs> brush it off between coats. And I was just intimidated beyond belief because this was Bill Glass. And I knew this was a huge project. And so I sat down and I can show you today that piece in the installation, that first piece. It was a piece of the rattlesnake. <laughs> But I worked all day, and I just loved it. And my old background from the ceramics classes, you know, came back to me. I remembered, you know, working with the clay, so I picked it up really quickly, and um, I came back the next day. And Bill said, would you like to clock in? And I said, no. I just want to be part of this project, and I want to learn from you. And I knew that Chattanooga was a major trailhead for the Trail of Tears, and I knew that my family had come through that area during removal, that they had walked on that very spot. So I wanted to be part of that. So I volunteered and I worked every, every weekend, every holiday off work, every chance I got, I was up at Bill's helping them with that project. 
That's a great story, and I want to get it straight. Did you anticipate that you were actually going to work that first day when you were no. in the district? No, <laughs> I had no you. idea. I just went to see what they were working on and to meet Bill. <laughs> That's wonderful. So you did you go out there with the group? I went out there for the opening, and several artists went from Cherokee Nation, and we had um, had a booth, had a big tent for the artists. They had all kinds of festivities going on. Uh, the chief went, the council, all the elected officials, and uh, it was a huge festival. So um, I ended up driving a truck uh, and trailer that belonged to Cherokee Nation, hauling art for several other artists. And a lot of people rode a bus down there. So Sharon Erla and I, who Sharon's a wonderful painter, um, she rode with me and we drove to Chattanooga and just had a great time. But it, it was really, um, really exciting for us to see. Sharon also worked on the project and it was so exciting for us to see the art installed and see the water that comes down the steps to the river. And um, Demas had, Demas Glass, Bill's son had a stainless steel water spider in a reflecting pool. And Robbie McMurtry, who's gone now, um, Robbie had seven stickball player figures that were on the north wall that were just wonderful. So it was really exciting to see all that in place and to see our names on this plaque on the wall where we knew our ancestors had you know, been forced to leave so many years ago. But, and they listed the, vol the studio artist mm -hmm. names as well as... Uh, yeah, they listed uh, studio volunteers, uh, everyone that had anything to do with it. We all got our names on there. So I, I was really honored <laughs> that when they told me my name would be on there. And then Bill said, well, I was going to put Corkscrew, the studio dog's name, on there too, but I decided against it. <laughs> <laughs> so then did you begin to experiment with your own pottery? I did. When that project ended, um, it affected all of us very deeply. I only worked four months, but the others have been working for a full year, 24-7. I mean, they were, every day they were working on that. They had been behind schedule. But they said when they had a need, Bill got behind and he was just wondering how he was going to get caught back up. And um, the other Lisa, Elisa uh, Balloon, knocked on his door and she needed some work for an internship. so. She started working with them, and then they were needing help again, and Ken just happened to bring me up there. Uh, every time they had a problem, someone would walk in the door that could solve their problem. But when it was over, we just felt such a loss, just such a big emptiness, and I missed the camaraderie. I missed that creative energy, and I realized that uh, creativity was what was missing from my life. So I wanted to continue, and I saw in the newspaper that Jane Austen was offering a traditional pottery class. And I'd always been interested in the traditional pottery. And I had taken wheel thrown ceramics in college, but I didn't stick with it. But I'd never tried the traditional. So I started, I took Jane's class. And it was, a, I think, four weeks, two times a week. And when it was over, um, I thought, well, I'll just try to continue this at home. And Jane wouldn't let me quit. We worked out a deal where I would work for her in the studio and help her with um, things on the computer, things that she didn't know how to do in exchange for lessons. So I worked with Jane for a full year in her studio and uh, she encouraged me to enter the art shows. Uh, she showed me the ropes, introduced me to people and really helped me get started at the art markets because it's, it's tough to just get thrown in, into an art market without knowing what to do, where to go, how to navigate the system. Right. What a wonderful apprenticeship. So did you actually sort of share a booth with her towards the end a little bit? No, or? I didn't share a booth with her. I had my own booth. But I think Idle Jork was the first show that I did. And I went up there all by myself. And she was there. We didn't travel together or anything. but. Um, it was pretty scary going to a strange town, not knowing where the museum was and 
not knowing where to go unload or where to park. Um, it was pretty intimidating, but Jane kind of helped me out, gave me advice, and, and um, I sold several things. I, I didn't do real well, but well enough. <laughs> Had you entered the competition at Idle Jorg that first year? I did. Um, I think I got sec. No, I got third place. Was, what, what was your reaction to that? I was stunned. I was really surprised. Some intense competition. Yeah. Yeah, I was happy with it. It was, and I don't think I fully realized at the time how uh, stiff the competition was up there. But I, I was excited, but then later I started to realize I, I had won a first place at the Cherokee Heritage Center in my first competition. And then I got the third place, and I learned very quickly that a third place at Eideltorg carried way more weight than a first place <laughs> here locally. <laughs> Who were some of the other potters you admired? Joel Queen. Um, Joel taught me a lot. He taught me the stamped pottery. He's an Eastern band potter and a very dear friend of mine. Um, How did you meet him? Jane and I heard about a Kuala Pottery Conference in North Carolina. And up until that time, we had been doing Southeast style pottery, mound builder pottery, but we didn't have anything that was just specifically Cherokee. Well, this was a Cherokee pottery conference. So, we neither of us had the money to go, and I talked to Chief Smith into sending me there to do research for the Building One Fire book, which he published. And Jane, um, someone sponsored her, and you know we barely had any money, and we went down to this conference. And I did make a lot of good contacts for that book, <laughs> but uh, we met. It was an archaeology conference. And there were four potters there, and it was me, Jane, Joel Queen, and Tamara Bean. And by noon, the four of us had got together and planned a pottery class here in Oklahoma to teach us that stamped pottery that's unique to Cherokee pottery. Um, Tamara and Joel were part of the, um, the revival in North Carolina. The stamped pottery was lost for about 90 years, or all but lost. When Anna Mitchell revived pottery here in Oklahoma, she didn't have wood paddles. She made clay stamps with the same designs, but she didn't use the paddles. But Joel taught us that technique. Um, the museum in North Carolina, and I think the university, oh, I think it was UNC at Chapel Hill that, that partnered with them. There were a couple of different entities, and they revived the pottery form and formed a potter's guild. And Tamara Bean was part of that, too. So she's another potter that I admire a lot. Uh, Tammy can take, you can show her a broken piece of pottery and she can tell you where it probably came from and recreate the whole pot. Um, Joel, Joel's just crazy talented. He taught us, he, he's taught me more little tri uh, tricks, shortcuts, how to fix things. He's he, I, that's my favorite thing to do when I go to North Carolina is to go to Joel's studio and just sit and talk to him and watch him work. And of course, Anna Mitchell, he can't not mention Anna. Anna, um, if she didn't, most of the potters that are doing this pottery today, if Anna didn't teach them, she taught our teachers. She's just a huge, huge influence on all the potters. How did you become interested in Southeastern Applique beadwork? Martha Berry. <laughs> <laughs> I love beadwork and I had been doing, making earrings and just playing with beads for years. And Martha offered a class at the Cherokee Heritage Center and I can't remember what the first class, maybe it was a sash. And I took the class and I really enjoyed it, but I didn't finish my project. And she gave another class. Um, you just took it home with you and. Yeah, I just never it finished it. Us. So I took another class of Martha's and I got to be friends with her. And when I was working on that Building One Fire book, we did a call for art. 
and people were sending me pictures of old beadwork. And after about a year, it dawned on me, I bet Martha would like to see these. And I sent her uh, several pictures, and we found some very significant pieces. And one of them, uh, Martha started crying when I sent it to her. I'm always making her cry. But I, I said, here's this ugly little purse from NMAI. And she's like, you don't know what you sent me. You don't know what you've done. She had been trying for um, maybe 10 years to document these little purses like the one behind me. She knew they, that Cherokees had them, but she could not document that Cherokees made them. And I just sent her an example from the Smithsonian with the documentation. So her next class she taught was the little beaded bags, and I was in that class. And then Martha realized I was as interested in the research and the history behind it as she was. So she took me under her wing and threatened to kill me if I ever quit doing beadwork. <laughs> made me learn, she trained me to teach classes, and I still think she and Mary Ellen tricked me into teaching that first class. We'll talk about that, that your first teaching experience in, in deed work. <laughs> I taught the first time, I used to be really shy and never wanted to be in the, the center of attention and I didn't like to talk in front of people. And Martha, she made me teach with her. I was her apprentice apprentice teacher. So we taught the class and um, she did most of the work, most of the talking, but I liked it. I had fun and I learned, I paid close attention to how she taught things, how she demonstrated. And then the next year, I noticed they had scheduled a beginning Cherokee beadwork class. I kept saying, who's teaching this class? Who's going to teach? And nobody knew. Nobody would say anything. And then when it came right down, almost time for the class, they said, would you teach? I still think she and Mary Ellen did that. It was a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, so I taught my first class, and I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, learn more about teaching now, so I can, I think I could streamline things a little bit more. And then you became interested sort of in the bigger picture of like some um, 18th and 19th century Cherokee clothing. Yeah, I started, I went to North Carolina. Um, I'd met some of the people, some of the artists there when I was working on the Building One Fire book, which I worked on it for five and a half years. It took us that long to um, get the book finished and I was uh, what was my title, managing director, something like that. But uh, my job was to uh, take care of the releases, the paperwork, and to log all the photographs. And we had thousands of photographs. So I went on most of the photo shoots. I worked with the, all the photographers. And I met a lot of artists. Well, I, st I went back to North Carolina uh, for an art market. And I met a lot of With the your pottery? Uh-huh. Okay. I met a lot of the artists there and a lot of the people that worked in the village. I met the warriors of Anikadua who were, they demonstrate the social dances um, and they're the ambassadors for the tribe. And one day we're photographing uh, some of the warriors in the, the uh, Kuala Co-op let us use their, um, their uh, classroom as a studio. So, but just for fun, we decided, uh, the photographers and I decided to take our picture with the guys. So there were, I think there were three of them. And so while we're posing, my friend, she had us scooted up so close to each other. And I felt like he was just poking me in the ribs. And he, he looked at me, he says, you need clothes like this. <laughs> and I said, well, I would like to have uh, 18th century clothing because everyone here wears the tear dresses and they're, terribly unflattering to anyone unless you're a skinny 12 year old. So I, I got interested in that and Barbara Duncan at the Museum of the Cherokee Indians shared all her research with me and a lot of information. And some of the guys helped me out. Um, they gave me, one of them gave me moccasins, one of them gave me jewelry, uh, a couple of the guys, um, and this was over a long period of time, a couple of them went fabric shopping with me. And they're telling me what fabrics to get. Um, if I 
started to wear something wrong, they would come tell me about it. Women didn't really, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but women didn't wear these historically. And sometimes I would listen to them and sometimes I would say, well, they do now. <laughs> so you were making women's clothing for yourself, sort of. Yeah. And learning in the process. Yeah, I, I enjoyed wearing the clothing. It was a lot more comfortable and practical than the chair dress. Um, it, it seems to help. I've learned that clothing helps people feel more of a connection to the festival. To the, they feel like if they talk to someone who is dressed in the time period or the cultural clothing, that makes them feel like they've had a closer connection and they, the tourists enjoy it, the art market buyers enjoy it. It leads to dialogue and you can tell them a little bit more about your history and why you're wearing certain things. And it's just, I, I just like wearing it at the festivals, so. Can you describe, was it a blouse and skirt or can you describe a little the, bit? The um, men and women both wore the linen trade shirts the, they were shipped over from England by the bale. They, they were white linen shirts, long sleeve, um, loose fitting. So they're very comfortable. And women wore a wool wrap skirt from Stroud Wool, which was made in Stroud, England. And the uh, identifying characteristic of that wool is the white sawtooth edge where it was clamped into a frame for dyeing. So Cherokees use that white sawtooth as, as a decoration, you know, as a border on your skirts. Um, and then uh, men and women both wore wool leggings that came up just above your knee and they were seamed on the side until after 1800 they had center seam leggings. And then the pucker toe moccasins. So at one point you decided to try a feather cape. Can you talk about how that happened? Well, Eastern Man started, I go to, to Cherokee, North Carolina at least two times a year, sometimes five times a year. I have a lot of friends there. Um, I'm very close to most of the artists and I noticed that they were starting to wear the, the feather capes with their traditional clothing. And there was an exhibit called Emissaries of Peace and it was taken from Lieutenant Henry Timberlake's uh, journals and he lived with the Cherokees for two months in 1762 and then he ended up taking three of the leaders to England and he described the women wearing these feather capes so I got really interested in that and um, Tanya Weevil and I decided we were going to make one. We knew that the lady who had made the Eastern Man capes was from Pittsburgh and she was not a native woman. She worked at a museum. She's a museum professional and she had replicated one of these feather capes. So we borrowed one that she had made that someone had purchased from her. And we locked ourselves in the Owen Schoolhouse, which is now a community building, for six days. And we studied that cape. We, we tried to follow the thread path. It's made on a hand-tied net and it's contoured to fit over your shoulders. So we, we thought maybe it was made into pieces and sewn together. We tried everything and we could not make it look like that. Finally, on the sixth day, she had to leave early and I was sitting there studying that cape. And I would look down, I would go to one knot and then I would tie it on my, my net. I would follow this to the next one. So I went knot to knot and it finally clicked how they were doing that. And it was very simple, of course, but we just made it difficult. So I made, uh, as far as I know, it's the first one that was made here in Cherokee Nation using the traditional methods. Now, Wendell Cochran made some turkey feather capes back in the 70s for Miss Cherokee. They weren't made on the net. They were more contemporary. And from what I understand, the Miss Cherokees hated wearing it because it was very, very hot. And, and they are very warm. A lot of the people think they were, uh, the white capes were for the beloved woman or signified status, but from all the research that I have done, 
uh, as far as I can tell, they were just simply for warmth. And they're, they're very warm. And did you use turkey feathers on yours too, the first one? No, time? I used yeah. goose feathers. The, historically, the women would have used flamingos, parrots, parakeets, ducks, geese, whatever, uh, the turkeys, whatever was bright and colorful. Mm -hmm. They preferred the bright colors. And from a, a lot of the descriptions, they were very colorful. And there were indigenous flamingos. They even used flamingo feathers. So I used uh, goose feathers, and I purchased them already dyed and sanitized. But when I add turkey feathers, I have to pluck those from the hide and clean them myself. So there's a lot more work involved in the turkey feathers. Right. So when did you first enter, um, and I think you called them topper capes, is that topper feather cape? When did you first enter one in a competition, and what was the reception for that? About two years ago, um, and I didn't, I don't think I placed. Uh, it was really kind of ignored. And people didn't know what to make of it, maybe. Yeah, um, I didn't, maybe I got an honorable mention. Was it at Cherokee Homecoming? It, or Cherokee either Home? Trail of Tears or Cherokee Homecoming, I can't remember. But I think one thing that hurt it was they hung it right beside Roy Boney's Ravenmocker painting. And of course, the raven walker is a witch who has black feathers and looks like a raven. And they hung my cape right beside it, which was kind of spooky. <laughs> but I didn't do very well there. And I entered, again, I entered the one behind me at the Five Tribes um, Art Under the Oaks. And I got second place there. And historically, Whatever I enter in that show that does not place or does not do well wins major awards elsewhere. <laughs> that, it, that's happened to me several times. So I took it to Idle Jork, that was my, I took it to Red Earth. Um, I don't think I placed at Red Earth. I, I got a third place on a twined bag, no, on pottery that was imprinted with twined textile. But I don't think the cape place at all. So and here I, it's all this work with the net. Yeah, two and, and a half months, you know, hand tied net, and each feather has to be individually, um, the quill has to be folded over and lashed down, and then they're individually sewn on. So there's, um, I think I figured there was 2,100 feathers at least in, in that cape. And I went to Idle Jorg and I entered it there in the cultural items and I entered some pottery. So when I went to pick up my items, they told me that um, they sent them with me. No, they told me they have to stay here for the preview party. And they gave me my papers and on one of them I saw it had best of division on the pottery. And I, I looked at that and she said, oh, you weren't supposed to see that. But she said, I'll just tell you, you got first place and best of division on your pottery. And I didn't know what I had won on the cape yet. So I came that night to the preview party and I could not hear the MC. The acoustics were terrible and they called the best of division winners up, which I already knew I'd won for pottery. And then they're reading down the list and he said my name again. And he said, oh, I must have lost my place. I'm repeating myself. And then he um, said something about first place and I still didn't know until I got inside and everyone was congratulating me and one of the other artists said two best of divisions I said oh no I just got best of division in pottery she said no you didn't you got best of division in cultural items I said no I didn't and I walked over there to look and there was a big gold star on the the label in front of my cape that said best of division so I ended up getting two first place and two best of divisions and had been in contention for best of show. So after the show, the judges started coming up to me and talking to me about the feather cape and telling me what they liked about it and you know why they had chosen it. Finally, some recognition. Yeah, I was stunned. I was really, here. really shocked. <laughs> so now when you do the capes, um, are they mainly for people? Um, you've, you've had them in some fashion shows, right? 
I had, yeah, I had one in the, the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association Conference in Tulsa. Um, I was asked to be on a panel and do a presentation at that conference. I met a lady in Santa Fe that invited me to attend, and she said, well, you can put some things in the fashion show if you'd like. And I said, well, I'm not really a designer. I only have that one thing, and I have clothing, but I make it only for myself, and obviously my clothing is not going to fit a model. And I had suggested Tanya Weevil uh, be a, another speaker. So Tanya, Margaret Roach Wheeler, and I were the three on the panel. And when we got when I got there, they were running around with all their clothes. They were all excited. They were finding models. And Tanya said, well, where's your clothes? And I said, I don't have anything but this cape. And she said, I thought you'd wear your 18th century clothes. And, and she said, you're not putting it in the show? And I, I said, well, not just one thing. That was when I found out that we were the fashion show. It was not a show that we were welcome to put items in. We were the fashion show. And it started in 45 minutes. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so they had found, Margaret had 10 pieces, I think, and Tanya had several. And they went around the conference and found models from the conference attendees. And um, Margaret had, her first model up was wearing a simple sheath dress with one shoulder. And she had a shawl over that and a headpiece. So when she came off the off the stage, we took off Margaret's shawl and put my feather cape on her and took off the headpiece. And and she went back out again, and no one even realized it was the same woman. But, <laughs> so I walked out on the stage and described my one little piece, and then I left the stage and Tanya took over. But it was exciting. It got a really good reception people approached me after the fashion show and talked to me about it did you get any orders from the fashion show i didn't i had one lady interested that may order one later but i am um, pretty much booked up with orders right now because most of them go to north carolina um i had three for miss cherokee contestants in north carolina and then Orlando Dugai, who's a Navajo fashion designer, has taken three of them so far. And he adds a silk lining, a stand-up beaded collar. Um, he's a silversmith, so he does a silver clasp with maybe a stone. And maybe he'll add exotic feathers. So he's putting them on the runway with his hand-stitched, hand-beaded evening gowns. And he's sold two, I think. And he just ordered two more. And the long one was actually made for him, but I don't I think I need to make him a different one that fits him a little better because it was longer, the proportions were different, and I had to experiment with the netting to make it fit right. But I've got orders um, let's see, two more. Uh, one is from uh, another artist that lives in Tulsa and one for a former Miss Cherokee that lives here, and then he wants to, and I think I have another one. I don't know, I had five orders anyway. Wow, so that turned out to be kind of a collaboration, a really neat ongoing yeah. collaboration. Um, what do you, is a museum show that you consider especially important to your career so far? Um, museum shows. I always enter at the, the local shows at the Cherokee Heritage Center. Um, the Idle George show, I think that was an important one to enter because I, w I was really surprised after my first time I went to a show in Santa Fe at, um, I can't remember which museum it was, that Native Treasures show. And the artists there, several of them remembered me. And that surprised me that they knew me from that one show. Um, I've been to Santa Fe Indian Market twice. You've had a booth there for two years? Uh-huh. Just the last two? or No, I went in 2010. I didn't do very well there. And I don't really care for the Santa Fe area that much. And I didn't go back because I, I came out in, way in the red. And this year, since this is my first year to be a full-time artist, and I can tell my work has improved a lot, I thought, well, I want to go back and try it one more time. 
and just see if it's different. So I partnered with one of my friends from North Carolina who's a shell carver and it was his first time to attend. So he needed someone to kind of show him the ropes and we ended up sharing a booth. And both of us, he did, he did very well and he won some prizes, but I won a prize in 2010, but this year I didn't have anything really that my my entry didn't fit any of the categories. What was it? It was a traditional pot and traditionally fired. Everything about it was traditional except I purchased the clay. And there is no category. You can't enter traditional with purchased clay. So it was in a, a what was it, Co contemporary pottery other classification. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with some of the really well-known potters there, so I didn't even place. Did you do pretty well at the market, though? Oh, I came within $90 of my goal, but I didn't really expect to sell much pottery there because it's a Southwest market and they're not familiar with Southeast, but surprisingly, my really traditional stuff did better than the more contemporary. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> I noticed you're involved with the Cherokee Native Art and Plant Society, and I was wondering how many artists are in that group and how that has impacted your work. There's uh, just a few of us that are really active with that, and right now it's kind of dormant. We haven't done a lot, but Roger and Shauna Kane and I think Jane Austey were some of the original founders of that group, and their focus was to work with those that have been named the Cherokee National Treasures that are mostly the elders, and all three of them are Cherokee National Treasures. So they, they wanted to help, maybe they go out and help gather the buck brush or honeysuckle, Roger and Shauna do river cane, and they were just helping some of the elders gather their materials and trying to promote them. And uh, after that, the Cherokee National Treasures Association kind of evolved from that, so they're sister organizations. So I was a volunteer with the Native Plant and Art and Plant Society, and then they asked me to be on the board of the new association. And I'm not a Cherokee National Treasure, but the, they wanted some non-national treasures on the board. So uh, they're focusing mostly on helping the elders market their work and, and promoting them. Um, they've gone to the tribe and got um, ask the chief to allow the National Treasures to have a free booth at any of the nation's art shows or events. Uh, sometimes they'll negotiate to get them a free room at the art market or something. So we just advocate for the elders and we're trying to record them, um, interview them, you know, preserve their knowledge. We do a lot of videotaping and interviewing of them and we, and we just have fun. That sounds like wonderful work. Um, yeah, I noticed that you actually have taken a workshop on art marketing and professional development. Was that helpful to you, to um, First Nations? Yeah, the First Nations Development Fund. That was very helpful. Um, they, they held that, I think, in Locust Grove, and they taught us about marketing our work, pricing, just all aspects. Uh, artists, most artists are terrible business people. <laughs> You know, we were creative, but we're not good at doing our paperwork and promoting ourselves. So I took that class and, and we learned a lot. I learned a lot from the other artists and it, it was a really good class. And I took the uh, follow-up classes to become one of the trainers, but I didn't get certified because my boss at the time would not let me off work to go to the certification. So. I'm still hoping that uh, whenever they have a certification somewhere close by that I can go get certified to be one of their trainers, which then I would go out with them. Uh, when they teach that class, they always have an artist trainer with them. Yeah, it'd be a great thing to be able to do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about your creative process and your techniques in a minute. but. Um, I was also wanting to ask you to explain a little bit about your studio situation here. Well, I'd been trying to work out of my home and I looked around one day, I had 30 something pots in my living room and I have a tiny house. So 
I've, I've there was a show coming up and I thought I've just got to do something I can't afford to build a studio I'd lost my job and you know art was my only income so I had to get ready for that show and I thought well maybe I'll go down to the art center and use some of their equipment and I thought I should just rent that studio because I knew this had come available and I came down and talked to them I said I want to rent that studio for just a couple of weeks and we talked about it and they said, well, we can do a month to month lease. So I was able to rent this space and I intended to do it just short term, but then I realized how much more productive I was. I get up, I come to work, I work here, you know, however long I want. If I get tired, I can go work at home. And it's really helped, uh, it's improved my artwork, it's helped me focus more. Um, it's just been a really good deal to have this opportunity to have this studio. Is it like a 20 minute drive or? Yeah, about 20 minutes. Yeah. So it's close enough. I, I enjoy interacting with other people. We've got the spider gallery just across, you know, the, across the way. And there are... And you've got work there. Well. Yeah, I sell my work there and, and they sell fairly well there. Uh, this building has offices in it, and there's uh, two or three more studios right now. There are classrooms here, so there's usually somebody, other people in here working. So it's better than working at home. I get that social interaction. Do you have any other galleries in Oklahoma besides? But... I have work in the Red Earth Gallery in Oklahoma City. Yeah, I, they gave me a show a couple, last year I think, called The Potter and the Painter. So I teamed up with a painter, Jim Vandeman, and um, the show was supposed to be up for three months, and they ended up, I, I went to pick my stuff up, and they said, we don't have anything to put in this case. Can we keep some of your stuff? So I still have a, a full display case up there. Oh, wow. I just wanted to ask you again about that transition, because you also mentioned that you, I don't know if you left your job or you lost your job, but that decision to make that leap into doing art full-time. Yeah, I lost my job. They did a reorganization and eliminated my job. So I, I had anticipated that this was going to happen. I was not happy in the job at all. I knew it was a mistake when I took it, but I worked there for three years. And it was a huge sense of relief to be away from all that stress. And I thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd saved my money, I'd, I'd planned for this. So I thought, well, I'll try doing art full time. I've always wanted, wondered if I could make it as an artist and always wondered where could I go if I had time to spend all the time I needed on one particular piece instead of rushing to make the deadline for a show and rushing to make some small things just to sell to make the gas money. So once I once I rented the studio, it really turned around for me, and I started um, selling more. My work improved. Um, everyone says I'm much calmer, much happier. I don't look so stressed <laughs> all the time, and I just—it's really been a positive thing for me. Which I'm not not making a lot of money, but I'm I'm getting by. Mm -hmm. Doing what you love. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you dig and process your own clay. Um, mm -hmm. What's your is your source nearby? Is it on your land or nearby? No, it's actually Corps of Engineers land uh, by Fort Gibson Lake, and that's where most of the local potters get their clay. Um, but the last time I dug there, the clay quality is not as good, and it's. It, it was never a very strong clay, but I liked working with it. But I broke like seven pots in 10 days and I don't break pots. And this was wow. building them, not firing. I would get them built up to a certain point and they would just crack. So the clay was too weak. Something had changed in the Yeah, something was different. Um, it just wasn't, maybe I can find a better vein of it, but they keep changing it. They keep bulldozing around there and and messing with it, so it's getting contaminated, I think. Mm. Um, you don't uh, 
in terms of the clay that you've dug that that was working well were you adding anything to it any shell or anything or just no but I've started adding something the last time I was in North Carolina I went to a clay company and I forgot to take the sample of course but I told them what was happening and they suggested a couple of different additives I could try so I tried one of them and it, it worked pretty well I was able to get a couple of pots finished with mm -hmm. that so I've got a couple that are ready to fire so we will see how it works <laughs> right um, some of your designs you talked about the the stamps the, the paddle stamp designs uh, do you hand carve then when, if you have an idea for a design do you carve your paddle and do all that no or? I don't carve them I, I'm not a wood carver so I, uh, most of the paddles I have were given to me by Joel Queen. Um, he's probably given me five or six paddles, and then I purchased some of his paddles at uh, one of the gift shops in North Carolina. And I have a few that were carved locally, but the majority of them were from Joel or Tammy Bean. Her husband Larry had carved some and given to me. How about um, textile prints? I noticed that some of your designs come from textile prints. When I was making the feather capes and I got into tying the nets and I helped Shauna Kane make her big turkey feather cape that won Best of Show a couple of years ago at Cherokee Art Market and it's on a twined net base because it's much larger than what I'm doing and that's when I learned twining and I enjoyed it and I started looking at some of the old uh, pottery and I found several online that were found in Tennessee and North Carolina and they were just broken pieces of pottery but it had the imprint of the textile. So I replicated several of those and I've been using those to print some of my pottery with. It's, it's fun to do, it's kind of challenging because each pot is different so I haven't really figured out the best way to get that imprint into the clay. Yeah, because it's when we think of textile, we think of something more one dimen or two-dimensional, but flat, very yeah. flat. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Do you do any incising of designs? I do incising. Um, I I've tried just about anything that was done historically. I've done it. Incising, carving, um, applique work. I've used shells, sticks. Uh, Pieces of glass, textile, cords, sticks, um, peach pits, corn cobs. <laughs> <laughs> I read uh, in one of your online articles that you used to kiln fire your pottery before you wood fired it. Do you still do that? I do that um, as a last resort. If I've purchased the clay, usually I will kill and fire it because it makes it stronger when I would fire it. And I don't have a really good uh, firing area. I need, I need to get some fire bricks and build it up because of the wind. The wind is so unpredictable here. And if I fire a big pot, I have to put it inside of a wash tub or a container to protect it and keep that temperature constant or it's gonna have temperature shock and crack. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've. I uh, kiln fired some first. Um, we had a really wet spring and I was not able to do any wood firing. So most of my purchased clay I went ahead and uh, kiln fired it, but I won't kiln fire my native clay because I can still enter that in a traditional category. Right. You uh, also mentioned in this same article that you preferred to wood fire at night because it's cooler and also during the full moon. Is that for the light or is that for another reason? I know it just turns out better during a full moon and I've heard other potters say that. I don't know what it is but I realized one time that, that nine times out of ten when I'm firing there is a full moon. Maybe that's when the weather conditions are right. Um, it, it's more peaceful but in the summertime I have asthma, so I get really sick when I fire, and it, it's physically hard on me to do traditional firing. And I may have to give it up, but 
I have to burn the fire several hours to build up a bed of coals and then I spread it out and then I put my pottery, I set it on broken pieces of pottery and I've got plenty of those <laughs> and then I build it up really slow and by the time I can put the pots in and start building up it's usually dusk and then it gets very still, very quiet so I, I keep adding wood until I get until it glows red or until I can't get close enough to put any more wood on the fire. If it's inside a container, I can't see when it glows. So it's enough to add another stick of wood, then I back off and I know it will reach that temperature. And then I can sit back and kind of enjoy it. And it's quiet. I can listen to all the animals, the, the sounds of the night, and just relax because it's really hard work. And, you know, I welcome that quiet time. And you also talked about, you know, kind of how each piece would have sort of its own smoke cloud um, that would be different from the others. And I do love the um, some of the coloring that you get, especially the white-gray combinations. But that's kind of a private moment in the process, isn't it? I mean, no one else would see those smoke clouds but you. The collectors yeah. would never see that. Yeah, it's really exciting. I usually leave my pots in overnight because it takes that long for it to cool enough for me to get them out of the fire. So the next morning, I can't wait to go look at them and see what see what I got, see what colors, you know. Sometimes some of my small pieces that are down directly in the coals, like my little turtles, I might have five different colors on them, you know, ranging from pink to brown to gray to tan and maybe some white. You, you just never know what you're going to get. Do you sketch out your designs, though, for your pots before you? Sometimes. You not always. Incising. My favorite thing is just to start incising freehand and just see what I come up with. That's my favorite, and it seems like a lot of the prizes I've won have been pots that I've done that to. I feel like, sometimes I feel like I've made the same pot two or three times, but they consistently win. How about your um, bead work? Have you mainly done purses, women's purses, or? I've done several purses. Um, I've done some of the 18th century style bags. I've done a couple of those, I think, which they have less bead work and they're kind of a different style. I've started a bandolier bag, but I'm not happy with it and I want to take out all the beads and I just haven't reached that point where mentally I'm ready to, to rip out all those beads. But at least, yeah, you can rip them out as opposed to with pots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how do you, um, do you sketch out your beadwork designs or how do you choose your colors? I, I sketch them out, but when I, when I get ready, I'll pick out my colors. Like maybe I've got certain colors that have been in my mind and I keep thinking, um, I, I'll just think about these colors and finally I'll pick out my beads and I'll lay them on the fabric. And I'll leave it laying somewhere that I walk by several times a day. And every time I go by, I'll look at it. I might move this one hank of beads next to the other, and I switch them around. And then when I'm finally satisfied, and those colors are like expressing what I want to to do, then I'll sketch out my design, and then I'll start beading. It's more about the color to me, I think, than design. When you, what influences which medium you're going to work on from day to day or week to week? Well, right now I really want to paint. I, I'm just dying to paint, but I can't. I've had art shows, so I'm known for pottery, so I needed to get pottery for the different shows. That's what sells. Um, I've got orders for the feather capes, which I, I don't really enjoy making them as much as other art forms, but I've got several orders and that's my income, so I have to do those. But I think if I could sit down and do whatever I wanted right now, I think I would paint and do beadwork. I just haven't done beadwork in a while and I really enjoy it. I'm glad you brought up the painting. I want to get back to that in a minute. but. In terms of the feather capes, are you able to charge a price that you feel like you 
you're able to pay yourself for your time. I, I think so. I, I made the mistake early on of giving discounts to a few friends and um, then I realized you know, I've got so many orders here, I need to go up. I don't think I was really paying myself enough because there really is a lot of work. Um, I took two and a half months working five and six hours a day on the, the longer one. I'm getting faster now, but it's still a lot of work, and I'm the only one. Well, Eastern Man people are calling me and ordering them, so there's not that many people that are making them. When you're doing something like that, um, either the beading or the capes, um, do you listen to music or watch TV? Or It depends. It just depends on my mood. Sometimes I want to listen to blues. Sometimes I want old blues. Then sometimes I want... I want loud rock music or there might be days when I just want total silence. I might not even turn on the TV, the radio, anything. Well talk about your painting a little bit because I know that that has been an interest of yours. Yeah, in 2009 Sharon Erla taught a painting class and I took her class and I painted a, a friend of mine who is also a painter which I realized pretty pretty soon that you know that was kind of a mistake because I was so worried about what he would think and he he is a painter and that was a little stressful and we were painting little five by five miniatures. Port was it a portrait type thing? Yeah and everybody else is painting people out of magazines or something and and but I always do that. I always it's it's like I always challenge myself if you know someone here is painting a flower, I got to paint a whole forest, you know. <laughs> but um, I, at first, I hated it. And Bill Glass was in the class with me, and, and both of us kept just, well, I, I just hate this. I, I, I'm sticking to clay, and Bill did really well too. He painted a, he painted his late brother, but um, mine turned out pretty good. I'm still not happy with it. I still paint on it now and then. But I took her class again, and as if I didn't get enough the first time. And I painted a picture of a little girl from a 1938 photograph. That she was actually in a group shot, but I cropped her out. And I just loved her expression, and um, something about that little girl really, you know, spoke to me. So I painted her, and I did pretty good. I won a second place ribbon on the painting. And it was really funny because at I did show. at Cherokee, North Carolina. At the I think it was a festival of Native peoples art market. Um, at that point, there were separate art markets, but separate events, but at the same uh, time. And when I went to pick up my painting, there's no awards ceremony down there. They open the door and say, "Okay, go see what you won." And I went to pick up my painting, and I think I had a, a piece of pottery in there. And my pottery had a ribbon, so I picked it up, and I started looking for my painting, and someone said, it's over there. The only two paintings left on the table were Gary Montgomery's 48 by 48 inch painting that had just won Best to Show at Red Earth. And my little five inch painting was right beside it. <laughs> Gary won first, and there was a, a red ribbon, I thought, that can't go with mine. And I thought, well, no, he didn't get second on that because he won best to show it. You know, obviously he got first and I, there was no other painting, so I took the ribbon. But I still wouldn't put it out. And this was a show that Joel Queen was one of the organizers of. And I took it to my booth and Joel came by and I'm like, Joel, did I really win this? And he said, yes, you did. So I put it out, and a few minutes later, one of the judges came up and said, how much for that painting? And I hadn't even thought about selling it. I would have taken it home and painted on it some more. I didn't like the background. And I said, um, I don't know. He said, how much? He said, I want to get it before the other judges get here. And I said, $200? And before I could blink, he was gone with my painting, and I was standing there with $200 <laughs> bills in my hand. You may need to do some more painting. <laughs> yeah. So I did the third one. It was a friend of mine that he was going through a rough time. Uh, he'd lost his wife and lost a sister. And uh, I had a beautiful uh, photograph of him. 
and he's got his head shaved. He's got the scalp lock, the, and he was in his 18th century clothes. And and I just loved the way the light was on his face, so I, I painted him. And that was my best painting. It was my third one, and this is, I mean, this is the first time I had painted um, since I was probably in the fifth grade. So I I spent a lot of time on on his painting, and I felt like I finally was starting to learn a little bit. And I entered that in a showdown in North Carolina, and I got first place on it. So I gave him the painting, so it, it was in a calendar too. He was very proud of that, he liked it. I took his picture holding the painting and the ribbon and everything. I'll have but, to look for that. Now are these oils that you're working in? Yeah, okay. I love oils. And I think they dry too fast. People <laughs> say they dry slow, but I thought, no, I'm still working, still blending. <laughs> Um, do you, do you tend to work on multiple pieces concurrently too, like if you're... Oh yes, I'm very ADD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I work on, um, from three to five pots at a time, and I jump back and forth from maybe beadwork to pottery. Um, like today I'm working up some clay, but at home I've got a net that I'm working on for a feather cape, and I might work on... I need to work on some jewelry. I've got some Christmas type shows coming up, so I need to make the, and it's always 18th century style or Mississippian style. I'm making some freshwater pearl necklaces with copper. Um, I might make some more of the twine bags. I just hop back and forth or from one to the other. Um, and you've talked a little bit about some of the research that you've done. Is it, do you find you don't have to do so much research nowadays because you sort of have got a lot of things in your head or? I probably do more because I'm more interested in it. I, I keep learning new things and the 1700s just fascinate me and I love to, to research the clothing. I've been to Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, a friend of mine got me access to their costume department. So another friend of mine, um, he makes regalia and he makes some of the clothing. So we, we got into the costume department and they gave us a tour and showed us around. And then he started looking through a doorway. He said, look in here, can we go in here, I wonder? And that's when they were actually doing the sewing and the mending. Because they costume, I can't remember how many hundreds, uh, like 1,200 um, interpreters, 1,200 characters, some of them do more than one. Mm -hmm. So they're always mending, repairing, making new things, replacing. Well, the lady that gave us the tour had moved on, but another lady saw, saw him looking through the doorway, and she recognized him as one of the dancers because this was Cherokee week. And the warriors of Anagatua go up there and, and dance on the palace green where the Cherokees danced in 1762 before they went to England. And she recognized him and she said, well, I'll take you in there. She ended up taking us to other areas that weren't really open to the public and uh, they even allowed us to purchase some of the clothes. He bought a couple of waistcoats. And that's another interesting thing about it is because that time period, Cherokees were mixing their clothing styles with English items or maybe military coats, boots, hats, mm -hmm. you know, something, anything new and different. It's just like now you see something new and think it's really cool and you want that too. So he bought a couple of the waistcoats and I'm still regretting that I didn't buy a skirt I saw. Oh, what great, what a great experience. Yeah, and the next day when uh, the festival started, uh, several of the artists were demonstrating different arts and they had told me at one point that I could come and demonstrate and then they said no we can't pay you because it only it's only Eastern Band and um, he said well I, I can't let you demonstrate because they might think there was some deal made or something I didn't quite understand but when we got ready to go I was traveling with my friend who was one of the dancers and he was also demonstrating beadwork and his brother was demonstrating quill work. And I partner with his brother a lot and share booths with him at art markets. And we got ready to go and he said, take your bag you're working on to demonstrate. I said, well, they told me I can't demonstrate. So the brothers looked at me, they said, 
you are with us. You take that bag and demonstrate you're sitting with us. So I took it and then they later thanked me for coming and demonstrating. So I got to be the first Cherokee Nation artist to demonstrate at Williamsburg. That is very cool. Um, and of course your creative process is probably different for different media too, but in general do you kind of keep a notebook that you write ideas down in or how do you? I have scraps of paper everywhere with notes and ideas, napkins, papers. <laughs> yeah, I have all kinds of little notebooks. Sometimes I go back and I can't manage to get them in my sketchbook for some reason. But um, sometimes I do go back and create them and it might be years later. I'll start something and then decide to finish it. You know, it might be several years later. Mm -hmm. um, do you like to work during the day or at night? Again, it may depend. It just depends. Um, I'm not really a morning person. Um, I tend to start working. I usually come into the studio around noon, maybe 11, and sometimes I work at home. If I have to work on my computer, if I need Wi-Fi, I come here. I don't have internet at home. And I'm, I'm able to use the Wi-Fi here. Um, you know, I'll, I'll work on all those things that take up time other than creating. But I like working into the evening. I don't like to stay here late at night by myself. It's kind of creepy in here. We hear things and things move around. Yeah. <laughs> well, looking back on your career so far, what's been a fork in the road or a kind of turning point moment? Hmm. Meeting Joel Queen was one of the turning points. And I think losing my job and getting the studio here has been a big one. But, when I, well, the first big one was meeting Bill Glass and, and getting started on that Chattanooga project. And I think that's really exciting to go back and, and visit that and see the artwork that we created. Have you been back a couple of times? A couple of times. That's great. Well, what's been one of the low points in your career so far? Going to the shows where you don't sell anything and it, sometimes it seems like everything just goes wrong, maybe it rains, or you don't win anything, you don't sell anything, and then you're out hundreds of dollars and have that long drive home. You know, that's been pretty bad, but um, I guess during, um, around 2010, when I, I left the chief's office and took that other job, it just killed my creativity. There for two and a half years, I didn't do any work to speak of. I just didn't have time. Um, I was so stressed. I didn't. I just didn't have any creative energy. Um, so it was really nice after I lost my job to get that bag. And it took a while. I had to. It was like I had to learn to work with clay again. Mm -hmm. What's been one of the high points? Probably the two best of divisions at Idle George. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I won, actually I've won three Best of Divisions this year. And so it has been a good thing to the have third this one was The uh, Southeast CSAM, the Chickasaw Nation. Right. Southeast Art Show and Market. Right. Yeah. And pottery, right? No, the Feather Cape again. the Feather again. Cape, okay. The wow. Feather Cape has won two Best of Divisions. <laughs> Was there anything we've forgotten to talk about or anything you'd like to add before we look at your work? Um, no, not really. <laughs> okay, well we're going to take a look at your pottery, your cape, and some of your beadwork. Okay. Alright, so this is one of your topper feather capes. Yeah, this one was um, a longer length than the historic ones. Ah. The men wore very long uh, feather capes or mantles historically. This one was actually, I made that for Orlando Dugai. He wanted to wear it on the runway. And um, I'm not sure if, he, if he's going to take it. It doesn't, I'm not real happy with the fit. 
but this is goose feathers on a hand tied net base and then I've added some of the turkey breast feathers around the top and I wanted them to stand up a little bit like a little collar. Yeah, you can see the turkey feathers standing up. Yeah. And they've got the, the shiny copper color on them. I really like that iridescence and contrast. And my goose feathers are turned upside down. That's the underside that shows. Oh. Because the underside is more shiny and it has that luster on it. Yeah, I mean, they pick up and reflect the light just beautifully. Cool. So talk about your beaded bag a little bit. That's beaded on 18th century uh, wool, trade wool, and glass seed beads. It's got a calico lining. Um, the white flower, I was kind of inspired by a, a Cherokee rose. And it's got the, the leaves with the lighter green accent. A lot of the Cherokee beadwork was outlined in white. And this would have been the style carried by an eight, 1800, shortly after 1800s, Cherokee women would have carried those. The clothing style from that time period, before that, women wore the full petticoats that had the slits in the side and you wore your pockets on a string around your waist. They weren't attached to your skirt. So when the style changed, the silhouette became slimmer and the waistline higher, you no longer could wear your pockets under your skirt, so they started carrying the little purses. And you've got one of your twine bags next to it. It's interesting. Yeah. Okay, what can you tell us about this pot? That pot, the shape would have been used as a cooking pot, and it has an incised design that I just freehanded. It's just started carving. Beautiful rim. Um, the rim of it, the applique rim strip, that is unique to Cherokee pots. Well, actually, I'm finding that some of the Southwest tribes have that type of applique, but uh, archaeologists that um, specialize in the Southeast pottery refer to that as a Cherokee rim. And it's just an applique strip that has a notched edge, which helps, kind of helps to press it into the clay when it's damp. But it would have been used for a cooking pot. Did you give it a title? Do you title your pottery sometimes? Um, if I enter a show, I do, because a lot of times I think the title helps. I, I still think that one of my pots, uh, it was called And Still the Waters Flow, and or Still the Waters Run, after Angie DeBose's book. I still think that title helped it win prizes. I won like four blue ribbons on that pot, and then someone bought it and spoiled my little fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna try to zoom in on one, a couple of your turtles here and fish. Yeah, I've got them in view. So tell us a little bit about those. They're fun. Those turtles are just a little fun thing that I enjoy doing. The one on the back left has a, is stamped with one of my pottery paddles. Okay. And the one in front of that with the spirals, that's from a little shell. It was actually an earring someone gave me made out of a shell and I immediately made it a pottery stand. You made a great design. <laughs> yeah, and some of the others are just freehand incised designs. Right. You can see a little bit of the multicolored iridescence. On yeah, I fire those directly in the coals so they really get the the hottest part of the fire and they're against those coals and, and longer probably and they get more vivid coloring. Right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Lisa. Thank you.